Hey, how you doing econ students? This is Jacob Clifford. Right now we're gonna go over a concept that a lot of students don't get in preparation for their tests when we talk about money, banking, and monetary policy. It's bank balance sheets. First up, a few definitions. A bank balance sheet shows the assets and liabilities for a bank. Remember, assets are the things that you own and liabilities are the things that the bank owes. Demand deposits is the money that people have deposited in the bank that the bank has to pay them back, right? So this, for a bank, is a liability, right? The money that people put in a bank has to be paid back, so that's a liability for the bank. Now, of course, the bank's gonna lend out some of that money, but they don't lend it all out. They have to hold some in reserves. That's called required reserves. It's the amount the bank has to hold by law. Also, there's excess reserves, which is the money that's above their required reserves. They can loan out, but they haven't loaned out yet. Now, depending on the question, you might see the idea of owner's equity. Owner's equity is the amount of money that's owed to the shareholders or the owners of the bank. So this is the amount of money that was put into the bank by the people who started the bank. Also, keep in mind, the owner's equity does not need to have any of it in required reserves. Only a portion of deposits that people have deposited are held in reserves. So they have to hold some of demand deposits, but none of the owner's equity. This shows you a bank balance balance sheet for some random bank, you've got liabilities over on this side, they've got $20,000 of demand deposits. People have deposited $20,000 in the bank, owner's equity is another $5,000 for a grand total of $25,000 in liabilities. Now, with that money that the bank owes other people, they're going to go and do something with it. In this case, they've got $2,000 of required reserves. $3,000 of excess reserves, money they can loan out, but for some reason they haven't yet. They bought $5,000 worth of treasury bonds and then uh, $15,000 of loans. So if you add that all up on the other side, that's $25,000 of assets. Now it's important to notice it's a bank balance sheet. It balances out. Whatever adds up here on the liability side needs to add up on the asset side. These two have to balance out. They need to be equal. Let's say Bob deposits $1,000 into this bank. So some random guy shows up and puts $1,000 in the bank. What's gonna happen? to each one of these, okay? So I want you to answer these questions, pause the video, write down one, two, three, four, five, answer these questions, see if you can figure it out, okay? Good luck. Okay, I'm gonna go over the answers. If you need more time, go ahead and pause it. First question is the most important one. You don't even need anything about Bob to figure it out. How much does this bank need to hold by law? Well, they've got $20,000 of demand deposits and they're holding $2,000 of required reserves and so the reserve requirement must be 0.1 or 10%. Bank only has to hold demand deposits in reserves, a portion of it. How much? Well, in this case, they're holding 2,000 of 20,000, that's 10%. What's gonna be the initial change in the money supply? Will it go up, go down, or stay the same? Now, important to understand, these questions, the way they, they are worded, really matters. If I asked you what's the total change in the money supply is a lot different than what's the initial change in the money supply. When it comes to the initial change in the M1 money supply, the answer is, it doesn't change at all. The M1 money supply stays the same. The reason why M1 money is you know, currency in people's pockets and money in banks and demand deposits. So it's the same, M M1 money is the same. So if I take you know, $1,000 from my pocket and put it in the bank, the initial change in money supply, there is no change at all. It's just changing the composition and where that money actually is in M1 money supply. First thing I want you to notice, this demand deposits is gonna go up, right? If instead of being 20,000, now it's gonna go to 21,000 because he deposited $1,000 in the bank. The owner's equity didn't actually change. Now, this bank needs to hold a portion of that $1,000. How much do they have to hold? Well, $100. So the reserve now, the, the required reserve now is gonna be 2,100. 2,100 is how much this bank has to hold now that they have $21,000 in demand deposits. And that tells you how much the excess reserves are. Before they were 3,000, but now they're free to loan out another $900. So the grand total for the excess reserves is 3,900. Question five, how much can this bank initially loan out? Well, I'm not asking how much total money supply is gonna change. I'm just saying what's the initial loan this bank can make based on this deposit. Well, on this deposit, they can loan out $900. It's the increase in excess reserves that this bank can do. Number six is actually talking about the maximum total change in the money supply. So once this bank loans out the $900, how much does that become in, you know, increase in the money supply? And the answer, well, if you're thinking, oh, it's $1,000 times the multiplier. Remember the multiplier is one over the reserve requirement. It's, you know, 1,000 times 10. No, it is not 10,000. The reason why is because I want to know the increase in the money supply. How much is the money supply going to change by? The answer is 9,000. Why 9,000? Because the $900 that initially gets loaned out is new money created times the 10 gives you $9,000 of new money supply increased by this. So multiply the initial loan amount 
by how much the multiplier is, that tells you how much new money was actually created. Now, if you're confused by that, that's okay. Don't, don't freak out. And the reason why is this fully won't make sense until I give you a whole nother example and you can compare the two. So here's a new scenario, same bank balance sheet from the very beginning. So we're back to the same balance sheet. We've got liabilities, assets, same numbers as before, except now let's say instead the Fed buys $1,000 of bonds. So the Fed comes in, does open market operation, buys $1,000 of bonds. Please answer question one through six, Pause the video, good luck. All right, here we go. For the first one, what is the required reserves? Now, we know the ratio is 0.1 or 10%, but I wanna know how much is the required reserves? Well, the required reserves don't change. They're still 2,000. Why? Because demand deposits didn't change. No one deposited money in this bank. The Fed didn't buy bonds by, you know, increasing demand deposits. The Fed didn't deposit money in the bank. The Fed just bought those treasury bonds, $1,000 of those treasury bonds back. So the reserve requirement still stays 10% and the required reserves still stay 2,000. Next question, what's the excess reserves? Well, that does change. Before it was 3,000, but now the bank has $4,000 of excess reserves that it can loan out. Wait, 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 how did I get 4,000? Well, take a look. When the Fed bought treasury bonds, that went from $5,000 on the treasury bonds down to 4,000, right? So the Fed said, I'm gonna buy those bonds back and they put money into the banking system. They put money in the bank, right? They bought the bonds. That $1,000, well, it doesn't go to loans. It doesn't go to required reserves. It ends up in excess reserves. That is not money. The bank is free to loan out. And that gives us the answer to question number three, right? It says, how much can this bank initially loan out of this transaction? In other words, when the Fed bought $1,000 worth of bonds, how much can the bank loan out? Well, all of it. They can now loan out another $1,000 they couldn't loan out before. Now, again, if you got confused by my question here, uh, yes, if you put in the excess reserves of 4,000, they can loan out 4,000, yes. I was trying to ask, how much more can the bank initially loan out? So now they can loan out another $1,000 more than they could before because the Fed bought those bonds, put money into the system. The entire amount of the Fed's purchase, the whole $1,000 is gonna get multiplied. Not only a piece of it, right? Because the bank can loan out $1,000. The initial amount they can loan out is $1,000. So that $1,000 times the multiplier of 10 is $10,000. That's the total increase in the money supply from the Fed buying $1,000 worth of bonds. And this is the most important part. Keep in mind last time when Bob deposited $1,000 in the bank, the result was only a 9,000 increase in the money supply. Keep that in your brain. If money is deposited into a bank, not all of it gets multiplied, only a portion that can get loaned out the initial loan out gets multiplied. Whereas when the Fed buys bonds, the entire thing gets multiplied. Now question five and six are the real hard ones that put it all together, but you're gonna get it if you understand the idea of fractional reserve banking. The initial change in demand deposits, there's no change, but the demand deposits for all banks will change once this bank starts loaning out and once money gets created. So this bank's gonna loan out $1,000, right? There, someone's gonna buy something and that money ends up back in another, another bank. That bank, right, is gonna have now $1,000 of demand deposits that goes up. That bank's gonna hold 100 in required reserves, loan out another 900, same thing's gonna happen, then demand deposits in a different bank, someone else is gonna deposit that money in another bank, now that $900. That keeps happening over and over again. So the total change for all banks in demand deposits is gonna be a total of $10,000. $10,000 of that, all that new money created is gonna end up in banks, assuming they have no excess reserves. If banks don't loan all the money out or if people destroy the money or if there's some other leakage, then maybe not all this money actually gets created, but the idea here is what's the maximum change? Well, there it is. Now, if you understand the answer to question five, you should also understand the idea to six, maximum change in required reserves. Well, the bank is gonna loan out that money, $1,000, that $1,000 ends up in another bank, that bank's gonna hold $100 and loan out the 900. That keeps happening over and over again. So the initial, the first bank that ends up with that money is gonna hold $100, right? Next one's gonna hold another 10%, another 10%, another 10%. So the total increase in the required reserves is actually end up being the $1,000 that was initially loaned out in the first place. So hopefully you guys get it. Here's a few more free responses in case you wanna practice this from the AP test, release free responses. So take a look at the 2011 question three, 2012 question two, and the 2016 question two. Try these, make sure you're getting them. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, take a look at some of my other videos. Until next time.